everybody. Welcome back to Bed, Bed Beat. Ooh, that's a, that sounds like a whole other series, not the one we're doing. It's a family-friendly show, April. <laughs> Clearly, I had a little time off, got a little rested, and then went insane. <laughs> Welcome back to Ed Beat, everybody. I'm April Cummings with Cayman Life TV, and joining me, as always, the brilliant Patrick Brandella, Cayman Current. Hi, Patrick. How's it going? Hi, April. I'm doing well. How are you? Not as well as I am, obviously, and I promise it is just water in this here glass today. Vacation's and over. Vacation's over. Back to work, and man, what do I like to say? So much to talk about, because we do. So let's get started, Patrick. You have been a very busy young man while I was, you know, tramping through malls and eating at Denny's. Um, let's get started with the uh, UCCI audit. What is this all about? And remember, I've been gone, so I'm trying to catch up just like everybody else. Great. Yeah, so the uh, UCCI audit in question um, is a human resources audit, and uh, it's something that's been in the works since uh, last year. Actually, um, it was the, a proposal by the previous uh, UCCI board before the changes got made and um, Gilbert McLean took over. So they've been thinking and talking about doing this um, for several months. And uh, the, the news is that it started in January. So the HR audit started at the beginning of January and it's being conducted by the government's internal audit unit, uh, which as a people, anybody who follows the news in Cayman uh, for a while knows that the internal audit unit typically produces really good reports. And sometimes those really good reports contain things that aren't so good. <laughs> and sometimes they, um, they, they uh, are positive, but always constructive. Um, so looking forward to seeing what uh, the government auditors come up with on this. Um, so kind of the background on this is, uh, I got this, I, I say quote news because this is, uh, you know, the thing started two months ago, but I just found out about it. And it's in these um, recently released minutes from the UCCI board meetings, uh, which confirmed that uh, the audit has begun. Um, so the context of the context of the reason for the audit is um, it's been a period of, as I say, clarifications and changes to hiring practices at uh, the Cayman Islands Public University. Um, and basically, in, in years past, UCCI didn't obtain work permits for non commanding employees. Uh, and the expe expectation was that they didn't have to, uh, nor did the university recruit for um, positions held by non Caymanians whenever their contracts were being renewed. And uh, so this is, this is kind of a legacy practice that has since been clarified I believe by an attorney general's opinion. Uh, so they're having to change the way they do things at UCCI and the HR, the auditors are coming in to analyze what they were doing in the past and probably suggest what they need to do um, now and going forward. And, and one thing I didn't know that I found out in the minutes is UCCI had been aware as far back as 2015 uh, that they were required to recruit for positions when these contract ren renewals were up for non Um if, if they change their practice as of 2015, um, the board isn't sure, but they do know that when the current human resources manager joined UCCI in 2018, that was not the practice uh, that the university was doing. So in 2015, they knew they were supposed to have to recruit for these positions. Three years later, they, they weren't doing it. Um, also, at the same time, no work permits were being secured for non Caymanians. So um, basically, if you were a professor at UCCI, an adjunct, um, you, they, they didn't think and they didn't obtain work permits for non Caymanians. Uh, so in fact, I, sorry. Oh, just one thing. One of the things that's interesting about this is that I probably have been working with civil service since about 2015, give or take this, this, mm -hmm. this, at this tenure point of my life tenure. And the practice has been to advertise all the positions that were, that are open. Um, 
for, for the traditional civil service. So it seems a bit sort of out of place for the public university that is, you know, funded by the government to not follow that same practice. Um, so it, 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 there's a disconnect there from, from my perspective um, right. when the civil service itself advertises these jobs. Right. And I'll, I mean, I'll and be UCCI, it internally sometimes, but, you know. Yeah. And, and UCCI is in a um, kind of unique position uh, in terms of uh, the different kinds of employees they have. So it's not quite like full time civil service jobs. And it's right. also not quite like full time teaching jobs at high school. So a lot right. of their employees and faculty will be um, essentially part time, uh, short term contract workers. And so, so you say adjunct professor, so say somebody's an accountant and they want to teach an accounting class at night. So they, they sign on for a semester and they teach the class. Um, were they in the past required to get work permits or were they not getting them? Well, no, they weren't. N now they have to. That, that's been clarified. Um, for example, and also get, getting yeah. permits doesn't also necessarily mean paying for permits either. I, I know that may not be at, at the core here, but um, uh, teachers and ministers and some other categories of folks, it's more about the process of hiring Caymanians first than it is about paying the work permit fee. So it's not like it would be a massive burden on the institution, although the cost of advertising, if you're doing it in print, for example, there is that. But Nonetheless, I think it's more um, the um, timing and flexibility that has become an issue. Yeah, because it does uh, take some time to do, you know. Yeah. Well, I know at the Cayman Current, as a nonprofit that you can donate to, we are exempt at from any work time. permit. We, we, are, we have to follow work permit laws, mm -hmm. but we are exempt from work permit fees. But, but I, I'll tell you what, if, if I could pay a fee to get it done quicker, I'd pay the fee every time. <laughs> Well, there is an expedited fee. There used to be anyway. I don't know if that still exists anymore. It's been a long time since I've been on that kind of paperwork, I have to be honest. So um, I didn't want to di digress, but I just did want to point out that there is it, statutory authorities, for example, sometimes have a slightly different set of rules and processes. But from an optics perspective, you would think that, that you know, the idea is we're in a country where Caymanians get first first crack at the job, first opportunity at the job, or at least to apply for the job. And if that wasn't occurring, that is a challenge. Right. And, um, you know, I think I think that's one thing that that keeps coming up in the board minute, minutes and the things they've been discussing is um, how UCCI can comply with laws like the Public Authorities uh, Act. I think it is now that they changed the name of Parliament. Now our laws are yeah. acts. Uh, acts, so, yeah, acts of Parliament. Yeah. So, so I think the HR audit, um, the point of it is to help them um, comply with these these laws and regulations that maybe maybe have changed or maybe they weren't didn't know that they had to follow in the past. Um, and just, and just put, yeah, and just to put this in a um, in the proper timeline. Uh, so uh, the president of UCCI as of 2015 was Roy Bodden. So his tenure was from 2009 to the end of 2018. Then uh, the immediate past president and CEO, Stacey McAfee, uh, officially joined the university in January 2019. She was the, the first and only UCCI employee to have a work permit. So, so this kind of process did impact the leader of the university. And uh, that the, the note, both the, the notice period and the work permit requirement are two distinct issues. Um, but, but, but both impacted McAfee on when it came time at the end of her three-year contract. And as people will know, if they um, read the current or, or follow along, um, Dr. McAfee gave notice at the end of May 2021 and said, hey, at the end of the year, I'd like to uh, stay on as UCCI president. Uh, then the board changed. And in late September, they, they took up... Uh, Dr. McAfee's letter of intention, and they said, uh-oh, her work permit ends at the end of November, um, and we basically have to give give her an answer three months before the end of this, was it October, sorry, three months before the end of December. Yeah. So, they, so they only had a few days to tell her thumbs up or thumbs down, and mm -hmm. what they said is this put them in a big time crunch because they had four, four days to 
go through the whole uh, renewal and notice the um, advertising, the position and recruiting for the position. So they said they can possibly be done. So then they turned around and offered her a six month extension of her contract. And uh, Dr. McAfee refused that, uh, said, no, I'm not interested in that. And then even at the timing of when she left, uh, when she actually demitted her position, they, they were demit, which is great. Um, what coincided with the end of her work permit rather than the end of her contract. So these changing hiring and notice uh, practices did um, affect very much at the top of uh, the institution. So um, from your perspective, why should we be paying attention, for example, to matters like this um, in terms of how um, the rules are applied, um, the fact that there is an HR audit at all? Why is this important for the greater population to really follow along and have an understanding of? Well, if you wanted to start from the uh, kind of the day to day level and also in these minutes, they talk about how there was a scramble to go through the work permit process really, really quickly to hire adjunct professors to staff UCCI at the beginning of this semester. So mm -hmm. the ability or inability to get work permits um, uh, processed quickly. quickly and go through all these, um, go through the proper steps could impact a student who wants to take a class. So, so maybe the class so, doesn't exist because yeah. they can't get somebody in there in time. So having uh, my association with ICCI, the International College, which is not a public university, we've been dealing with this since whenever I, I was a kid. I remember people running around getting work forms and I would help cop photocopy things. And I mean, for the non-UCCI, this was a common practice. Um, and so for them, because this wasn't part of their uh, HR infrastructure and DNA. It's not to say that it was a bad institution because they had to scramble. It's because they just didn't have a lot of time to prepare and cement that into their processes. So from a student perspective, it's, hey, what happened to my class? <laughs> my teacher, you know, couldn't get a work permit in time. But from my perspective, outward looking in, these are public dollars in many instances that are being spent. So it's our money. So it's important for us to have an understanding of not just where the money goes, but how the institution is functioning and operating and just making sure that it is compliant with the, the, the laws of the land or the guidance as it needs to be. Yeah, and you could see um, changes. And so maybe, maybe even if it doesn't result in, um, say, a class being canceled yeah, or not being example. offered, it could result in a new face, new faces leading these classes. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe there's more Caymanians leading and teaching. Maybe it's just other expatriates. Um, maybe yeah. some some of the people teaching classes, say a permanent resident, who if they rule that they have to get their occupation added or changed on their permission mm -hmm. to work, maybe right. it, maybe it will be legally impossible for them to continue being a lecturer. I, I, I don't know and I don't think they know. No, but this, this, this process is important for, to help determine that. And also the, um, you know, people complain when the auditors, whether external or internal show up, but they can be incredibly helpful in ironing out problems with your own systems and processes. Um, nobody really wants to change. <laughs> Sometimes you just want to keep doing If what you did worked, you just want to keep doing it. But, you know, in, in all fairness, sometimes we do get stuck in the routine of doing it the way we've always done it. And it can be, it can bring, like you said, fresh blood, different faces, new opportunities. It can also pro highlight problems that need to be resolved, um, not just internally, but externally, for example. But still it, you know, I don't see very many people cheering when the internal audit guys show up. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad well, I mean, for from the outside, and, and I see it, you're going to, you know, uh, UCCI has been giving um, notice on the contract renewals. It's not to say that they yeah. haven't been doing that as yeah. of I, yeah. this year or last year, but they, they weren't doing it in 2018. Um, so, you know, if you have an interest in teaching a class, mm -hmm or right. another position at UCCI, these, these notices and these advertisements are, are coming up. So, um, you know, there's, there's the opportunity. 
And I think too, um, Patrick, even when you um, don't get a job, but you apply for it, or at least um, start to see that advertising and promotion, I think it also can inspire some people sometimes to um, get their own qualifications to where they need to be in order to be able to teach or the experience that they need in order to be able to do that. Because teaching, while people complain um, a lot about how hard it can be, it's also incredibly challenging uh, on a good day. So I think that's, um, you know, there, there is, there are several good things to be, to, to potentially come of this, um, whether you're a student or a potential lecturer or instructor. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add on that point? Or do we get to talk about my other favorite um, subject, which is education related as well? Yeah, we can move from the internal audit unit to the auditor general's office because this is, you know, internal, external. This is this is like the fireworks show. It's so uh, it's not dry at all. Um, no, <laughs> no, but you know something? It is like sometimes it's not the exciting stuff, Patrick. That is truly a benefit in the long run. Yeah, I'm trying to peas and carrots. <laughs> yeah, so the yeah. peas. And go together like peas and carrots. So, and carrots. so moving on to the auditor general. Um, so the auditor office of the auditor general has been publishing a series of follow up reports um, where they'll um, basically do performance evaluation reports of different government entities, and then they'll present them to the PAC uh, Public Accounts Committee, and um, the auditor general will have recommendations. The PAC will throw in their recommendations. And then sometimes you wonder what happens to these reports. And maybe they sit on the shelf for a few years or go in a closet or line a birdcage. Uh, but not so, because no. the Auditor General is doing a series of follow ups of, hey, whatever happened to dot, dot, dot. So mm -hmm. in, this, in this recent report they put out, uh, it, it involves three areas of government. Uh, the one that I'm concerned about is education but it also goes over customs and capital projects. Uh, so out of the three entities, education was the star of this report. Um, they said they had, they had made basically made by far significantly the most progress on the re recommendations that had been put forth to them in October, 2019, which is about two and a half years ago. Uh, but, you know, things can be, what is it, is relativity. Because uh, mm -hmm. even though education was doing the best, overall they were judged to have made some progress. So right. specifically, the Auditor General and the PAC had made 18 recommendations, uh, big ones and little ones. Um, education, uh, primarily the Ministry of Education, but um, there's also the Department of Education Services and Education Council. So I'll use a broad term, education officials had fully implemented 11 of them. They'd made progress on nine of them. And on one of the recommendations, it was uh, basically no progress. And on my story, I have a table at the bottom where people can dive in and look at all the recommendations. So I'm very excitedly pulling this up for folks to just see. Yeah. Um, this is the report and then your table. Wait, I have to do the little clicking thing, the link. Where's my table? By the way, you can sign up to receive um, news and announcements from Cayman Current, and he will never sell your information to anyone. Okay, nope. here we go. I don't There's care, your don't table. Sell. There's the table. Uh, so, so just to put it in context, and I, you know, people, um, you know, it, it almost goes without being said, but it has to be said. Is uh, the primary reason cited for not implementing the recommendations they didn't do is COVID nineteen. And uh, as everybody knows, education has had to shift a, a ton of resources throughout the whole education structure to deal with the response to COVID, um, whether that's uh, from uh, planning and strategy and virtual learning or getting LFT kits together and making hand washing stations and all of that. So, you know, it's really been all hands on deck for them. Uh, so while they've Absolutely. been dealing with the immediate stuff, I specifically some of the medium long-term stuff has not been gotten to yet. Uh, for example, um, the, the area where they had the least progress on was a, a, in creating a long-term financial plan informed by a uh, capital projects master plan, which I'm not sure um, may or may not exist and may or may not be in the education ministry's remit. 
uh, student population projections and workforce plans. Um, the pandemic had also delayed the development of a medium to long-term education strategy, um, plans to improve education attainment by students and analyses, my favorite thing, analyses of per student costs in public schools benchmarked against local private schools and schools in comparable countries. Uh, so that, that's been put on the back burner while they're dealing with uh, the pandemic. So Patrick, would you say, um, you know, of these areas, I mean, it looks, it, it's, it's reasonable to understand why there might be some delays. And, yeah. um, you know, I, as I kind of reviewed your, your article, it, it seemed to me that, um, some of the things that the um, AG's office mentioned might be considered best practices as opposed to just okay practices. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's, there's a, right. there, there, there are a variety of levels of things that need to be done that, that could be done that would be great, but not all of these are, are mission critical in the short term. Several of them seem to be um, longer term, big, big picture vision things, or did I, misinterpret that. That's just kind of the impression that I got from, right. from, from and, reviewing it. And I think I've, I've mentioned this, I, I always talk about this, but maybe not on EdBeat, but you know, you divide your, your quadrant of decisions, things. So you have uh, urgent and important, urgent, but not important, not important and not urgent and um, urge, uh, Im important, but not urgent, whatever. <laughs> so if you look at this rubric, you, you'd say responding to COVID-19 is urgent and important. It's it's an emergency. You got to do it. So that, that's what they've been doing. These long-term plans, I'd put that in, in a not urgent, but important. But important. And those are the things that can tend to slip when you're caught up in the day-to-day. -day. Uh, so for sure. For sure. For, at, at a bare minimum, these kind of gentle reminders by the Auditor General that no, these still recommendations, these recommendations are still in place. We still expect, uh, we and the, and the PAC uh, still expect um, progress reports and, and, and reasons, you know, you know, valid reasons, not excuses, like that valid reasons why you haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and, and like the spirit, a uh, tone of being constructive. Um, so, you know, it, it's important as like a gentle nudge. Hey, I remember this report that, um, we said we wanted in this master plan now, you know, and the education's up to their eyeballs and LFT kits and software. <laughs> They're like, what long term? I don't have time for you. And the, the, the one thing um, I would like to throw in so that folks, um, people bear in mind, the reports are one thing. When they are discussed in the public accounts committee, though, it can take on an entirely different feeling and tone. So when you're reading the report and you're calm with your coffee and you're looking at your things, you're like, yeah. okay, we need to work on this. These are important. But man, when you are sitting in the public accounts committee getting grilled by politicians, why haven't you done this, 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 and this, which doesn't always happen that way, but it can, is what I'm yes. getting at. It, it, it can add a whole other level of stress and tone to the whole situation. So that is one of the things to bear in mind. People sometimes wonder, um, you know, uh, education folks getting beat up in the public accounts committee. And it's like, well, part of this is the, dis is the opportunity to discuss it for the politicians to ask questions on behalf of their constituents. Um, that is actually a separate part of the process than the report itself, right? So the Office of the um, Auditor General gathers information, reviews it, analyzes it, puts the report together, then it goes at a certain stage to the Public Accounts Committee and it gets discussed in a more sort of public forum. And I think sometimes, um, you know, that's where the fireworks are, Patrick, is in the Public Accounts Committee discussion, but the, the, the more important component is, like you said, staying, here's the gentle but firm nudge that these are important matters that should not be thrown to the wayside. <laughs> it's, it's just one of those balancing acts, um, you know, in my view about um, being held accountability and the way that it works isn't always comfortable all of the time, but it's still a crucial component of improving the quality of service. Yeah. And, you know, this, this report, this update from the Auditor General, um, it contained new, you know, news to me. Uh, for example, um, I didn't know so the Ministry of Education has entered into agreement with England's Department of Education 
to administer England's key stage exams in Cayman's government schools. And I said, oh, really? Because, you know, they've been they've been pushing in this, you know, like the UK standardizing with the UK national curriculum. So they're actually going to have the English uh, officials um, be in charge of administering these these key stage exams, which, um, you know, as parents know, but other people might not, you know, uh, every few years from primary on through secondary, they do end of year exams and check where the kids are. Uh, before you get to those all important year 11, year 12 exams. Um, so for me, that, that's, a, that's a, a very concrete move showing this, this shift in alignment to what the public education system is going to be compared to. So uh, from a, a parental perspective, if you're coming from, let's say, the U.S. Um, system, you might look at them. There are they have exams, but they also have certain assessment testing at certain components. Um, as I recall, well, my kids are all too old for this now, but I seem to recall we would the, the, the testing occurring was at the end of the year or something like that, um, or at a certain stage, just to assess where they were on grade level. Yeah. Um, these are like that to a degree. Yeah, we have uh, word, except on the UK style. Going going to school in Texas, I mean, they they shifted the standardized. They changed the standardized test more than we got tested. So we have a talk. <laughs> Didn't you have and star the test too? Test and it is just, yeah. you know, what, which multiple choice tests are we taking today under what system? Just take them all. Just take them all. But it does help provide some benchmarking information, um, you know, to do this as well as you. So you can see where you are aligned um, in terms of your performance or your grade level to that UK standard. And if we're moving in that direction in terms of our, our, our government um, schools, it would make sense to actually get some expertise from the people we are benchmarking against. I did have some concerns and I, I don't know if they're valid concerns, but we are also not in the UK. We are in the Caribbean and there are components of our history and culture and that sort of stuff that I do worry sometimes may get left out. I myself ended up so Americanized that there were a lot of components of my Caymanian heritage that sort of just sort of slipped down the chain, you know, and I don't think that they've ever come back. It may be Caribbean geography versus my knowledge of the UK, Europe, U.S., for example. So there are, there are some things that occur sometimes throughout those changes that I think as a society would be important to look into and make sure that we're still keeping that intact, if we aren't already, because we could, because my kids are older than this. So, <laughs> so uh, I would help you more. So I know in the, in the curriculum, they do, they do have, um, it's a ta tailored curriculum, so they do have mm -hmm. the history and culture uh, emphasis and course work. I don't know to what extent it's in there because I don't follow my kids homework that much, but, For but shame. Do, and also in this report, it does talk about how they've implemented um, cultural history, sensitivity, uh, regular workshops for teachers here right. so that the teachers um, are given uh, the background as well, because that, that was a concern coming from the PAC uh, was, was people teaching our children don't know much about the history of culture. So they've, that's one of the fully the fully implemented recommendations nice. they've done, um, and it's also I think it's also worth noting that um, in addition to the 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 English folks uh, administering the key stage exams, uh, the the I believe it's the ministry here has also purchased like a soft a big software package or something oh, to good. benchmark uh, our students. So they're doing it with costs. And they're doing it with academic performance, so they want they want to be able to benchmark uh, Caymanian students' performance, not only with the UK but also with the Caribbean, mm -hmm. which which I found is difficult because they take different tests. Um, so they 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 have a software solution uh, to do that. However, because COVID nineteen <laughs> changed the way that the exams were being administered in in the Caribbean and in different parts of the UK and the international exams, mm -hmm. they're unable to have this uh, comparative assessment this year. It does so, take some work come. too. So, so, so soon come. So, so that was so cute, Patrick. Um, My Caymanian cultural immersion. <laughs> 
you're on it, man. So, um, and dude is my um, American culture component of me. I just say dude all the time. And I think that makes up for anything I don't know about the US. But the, um, I digressed myself, I distracted myself. So in terms of the, the, the software, as I'm seeing it anyway, it's, it reminds me to the process that a registrar or someone um, dealing with a transition from one school to another might need to do in order to see whether the work from, let's say, this grade in this school system applies to this school system that they're moving into and how that works. And that actually can be quite an elaborate process to go through because there's so many things. Um, yes, you have different curriculums, but there are certain, certain items or components of your education that you need to learn. And when they happen, they vary. So one of my kids struggled with the transition from the US system to the UK system because the UK system had already done certain modules or blocks of content that in the US system would not have occurred until the following year. So there's right. some of those kinds of things. And so having software as great as it is, you still are gonna need to take some time to set it up correctly so that it gives you, what is it, garbage in, garbage out, good data in, good data out. It takes time to do that right no matter what the software is. And um, I guess so, so have a couple more points on this. One, one thing that's of concern to me personally is I've been waiting on tinter hooks, as they say, uh, for the new, the annual education data report to come out. Right. And mm -hmm. it was a recommendation uh, and one that they did that you want the annual data report to come out the same year that the tests are being taken. So if you take a right. test in spring 2021, the data report should come out by the end of 2021. They, they had done that the previous year, and I believe the year before. This year, I haven't seen it yet. Um, I Maybe it's out. Maybe it's in a corner of a website I haven't seen yet. If anybody knows where it is, um, please email me. Um, but in, in, this, in this particular report, they said as of December, uh, the government said all apparently known, all currently known indicators point to a January 2022 release for the mm -hmm. 2021 report. So we're in March now, and Same we again. have had uh, community spread, uh, Omicron, all this kind of stuff. So something could have come up, but uh, just suffice to say, I'm really waiting for that. Um, the data report is a very rich resource. It's one of the only, uh, it's a very a very good and it's the most comprehensive look at how things are going on in the public school system. And um, I think over the years, there's greater comparators with the private uh, side as well, uh, but not as much. So I'm, I'm really interested not only to see what it says, but to see the data that they are anal analyzing on both sides. So. so he's on it. And hopefully it's just hidden somewhere, you know, to be dug up. But if not, we will keep asking about it. All right. So we've talked a bit about the um, uh, one more general thing. One stuff. More thing. Oh, oh, yes, right. You had one more points. thing. Okay. Here's a recommendation that they hadn't really carried forward. And that's the PAC was concerned about private sector scholarships and, mm -hmm. and employers not giving Caymanians, not preparing them to take their shot and not giving them opportunities for advancement. Uh, and as we all know, the private sector is a major source of university level scholarships, both locally and abroad. Like they give a lot of money uh, for, for kids to go. Um, so the PAC recommended, there you go, that the Education Council, um, ex they, ex I, I don't want to misspeak, but they extending the role of the council beyond government scholarships to cover the private sector and the scholarships mm -hmm. they provide. So I don't know if that's administrative, if it's oversight, if it's an auditing thing, if it's, I, I don't know, but Education Council taking some sort of responsibility for private sector scholarships, which could be a very, um, that could be touchy. Know, political, touchy, yes, touchy, that could be touchy area. Yeah. So, so as of December, the Education Council uh, had done preliminary works, um, but they were focusing on streamlining the public scholarship process which I think people can see the results of. Uh, they changed Absolutely. the website, they changed the application. Um, so they've been doing that. You, there's tangible results on that end, but Absolutely. you know, yeah. that I've doesn't really answer, you know, the, the PAC wasn't asking about public scholarships. Right. 
Interestingly enough, though, it, it does seem that might be a bit of a stretch to do as well. I mean, unless, well, first of all, I didn't, there's no data that I saw to support that statement for sure. Um, it may be the case, but that does involve quite a bit of work. Um, and if you are getting, you know, work permit concessions because of your scholarship program, so be it, fine. But if you're not, and um, you're giving scholarships to whoever you want to as a private sector entity, it does seem a bit of a stretch to, to require government involvement in that. Um, I don't know. I mean, there, there may be a precedent that I clearly don't know about, but that does seem a bit far for me in terms of government um, and it's, you know, what its role is. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. To me, I see the seed of a, of a story uh, yeah. having been planted. <laughs> maybe that's what's and, wrong with us. We just, we're like, you know, ooh, Yeah, may, maybe in a year or two, like, this explodes into, you know, something we can pick the fruit of. Uh, but right now, it is an interesting, it is an interesting question. Um, and for me also about the role of government, um, you know, sometimes too, you have to finish sorting out your own stuff before you go into another area. So I wouldn't be critical of the, I mean, and oh, by the way, bias because kid on, you know, government scholarship currently enjoying it very much, learning, having a great time, but. Um, Making good grades. Thank the Lord. <laughs> thank the Lord. Um, but I will say also that, you know, I, I did see a dramatic improvement in the process itself because there were so many different things to do and it was just a little bit difficult technically speaking to do and I if, if my mother had to do that for me it wouldn't have happened you know um, oh. just it was too too much computer the the newer the new system is a bit simpler in terms of how to follow along um, and the rules are a bit easier to digest from from my end so um, I can understand that it's like before you give me a new set of things to oversee let's let's tidy up our stuff first for the things we are currently you know legally responsible for yeah and, and one that of was the, my editorial soapbox yeah and one, one of the things they're working on is um data gathering on the government scholarships mm -hmm. with the kind of trying to get quantitative data to analyze the effectiveness of these of this program um and, and the key question is hey when we send when we send somebody to school to study something do they end up getting a job uh, in, that's in their field of study or not? Yeah. Um, but there's so secondary, that's what they're looking at now. Yeah, there's secondary questions to that as well. You can get a government scholarship in a specific sector or area or subject matter, um, go through the whole thing, get your degree and realize you hate it, <laughs> you know, because a lot of kids don't have um, internships in those areas or they don't have a realistic sense of what the day-to-day -day job is like. So there, there are more layers than just, did I get a job in my field? That's, that's a right. huge primary question. But there are other questions that I think need to be asked as part of that. There are also things like life circumstances change, can change dramatically. Um, for folks. And so if I went to school to get a degree in journalism and then had my first kid, which this kind of did happen, actually, <laughs> um, uh, I pushed through anyway in the field, even though it was very, very challenging to be um, a young mother with a toddler trying to do live, you know, reports and cover plane crashes and be away from my kid. You know, um, my my idea of what life looked like was very, very different afterward. Now, I didn't have a government scholarship, so it doesn't really matter in that context. But for me, I, I think you have to be careful about mm -hmm. one size fits all data collection. <laughs> I think you need to bear in mind that it, it can be a little more nuanced. And so it's important to get a couple of those other things, not just what happened, but why did it happen this way? And if it, you're not getting your shot in private sector to work in these fields, uh, why or why not needs to be looked at as well. Yeah. April soapbox number two for Ed. And that's all we got to say about that. That's all. Oh, gosh, I watched that again. I was so happy about that. I cried like a child. Uh, Forrest Gump, great movie. Okay, so speaking of entertainment film and documentary and whatnot. Great movies. Great movies, great visual content and a wonderful transition to, <laughs> did you do that on purpose? It's just smooth.
you know? <laughs> you just move right over there. So, um, as you would know, if you were a regular viewer of EdBeat, um, Team and Current's been working on a really interesting documentary series and now has an amazing um, bit of news to announce in conjunction with said series, Patrick. I would drum roll, but I don't have a video clip with a drum roll in it. Yes, we do. Okay. I'm, I'm writing down the name of my sponsors to make sure I get all of them. <laughs> that is so That's gratuitously self so coming up. Uh, so, three. There we go. Yeah. So, our, um, we've been working on for whew, six, six, seven months a mm -hmm. uh, documentary on technical vocation training, education and training and STEM education. Uh, and the name of the, the name of the film is Island Jobs. And it's currently in post-production right now, which means we've shot all the footage, we've done all the interviews, we've written most of the scripts, and they're actually pulling the thing together, polishing it up, making it look, um, it's, it's really high quality. Uh, very, I've been very pleased, uh, pleasantly surprised by um, both the footage that, um, our journalist Kayla Young was was able to capture and the content and then the work that the studio has already done, even though they keep saying we're not we haven't even really done the mastering work yet. But to me, it looks great as a as, you know, kind of a casual consumer of video content. Uh, but when we're finished, we're going to it's going to be a series of five half hour episodes. And by half hour, I mean a TV half hour. So like 20, to like 20, 20, 21 minutes. Give or take. Yep. And, and then we'll also have a uh, director's cut or a feature length cut. Uh, so we'll have the five episodes. We'll also have a cut where we put them together to form a 90 minute uh, feature length uh, proper documentary, uh, mm -hmm. which is really, really cool because I've never done anything like this. Um, and the news we have is this week, uh, this past week, we reached an agreement uh, with the Cayman Documentary Festival, which is a, a three day event. I think it's the first one ever. Uh, to show the first episode, so our first half-hour episode of Island Jobs, like a premiere. Yes, kind of. the premiere with an E. And uh, on Island Jobs, it's going to take place on Friday. So mark your calendars, people. Friday, uh, March 18th, in the evening, and um, it's going to be shown after a. It's U.S. or North American. I don't know. It's a because most of the documentaries are international documentaries so so our episode is going to be shown after a film called the great disconnect which mm -hmm. examines mental health issues uh and it's so it's going to be the great disconnect island jobs episode and then we're going to have a panel on mental health uh which is also going to be connected to education and the panel is going to be moderated by kayla young who as i mentioned is the journalist who is actually doing our documentary so we're really excited about um, the opportunity to participate. And for me, it's kind of a, a, a big, you know, a really big deal that we're showing um, this uh, multimedia project uh, to the public and in this, uh, you know, very, pu very public venue. It's, um, you know, <laughs> it's our first I step into this... a larger world. Um, so, th so this year in 2022, um, so the past year and a half, we've really done a lot with me behind a computer screen and shoving recorders in people's faces and coming up with um, things, things to do virtually as the yeah. pandemic subsides. And for me, this year is the year where the current steps out into the real world. And this is really our first baby step into, um, in, into reality and in the community. And um, so we have a lot, a lot planned, a lot of ideas talking about and uh, getting um, agreements with people for for the past year to have regular in-person discussion panels and events. And we hope when the 90 minute film is finished to have a big premiere event standalone for the current on this documentary. So really uh, it's kind of like the next step in our evolution. Um, and just so people know, if you don't want to go to the documentary festival, uh, too bad. Because <laughs> I, know, I was is, waiting to see. <laughs> Too yeah. bad. You need to go. You have to go. It's uh, it's a sneak peek. Um, yeah. So right now we're not going to put up any of our episodes until everything's done, and it it hinges around the timing of the the premiere event of the documentary. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to get the sneak the sneak peek at at our at what we're doing, and you want to see the episode, you got to go 
to Commander Bay on in the cinema on Friday evening, you got to buy a ticket. I believe they're twenty five dollars, which is a good price. Go supports a good cause, yeah. and, um, and and go watch it. And yeah. and as I made notes on, are and you, and not even watch it, but hear the dulcet tones of April <laughs> Cummings, who's our <laughs> omniscient narrator uh, in the documentary. <laughs> So, so for the record, everyone, this is Patrick and Kayla's, all, this is all their work, right? So I just pop in as this, this, this female version of a James Earl Jones voice, not that good, but you know. So I want to be clear, like I didn't produce this, I didn't do all the work, I literally um, just read the beautifully written scripts that were provided to me by Patrick and Kayla. Um, and so far I've got to say, I've really enjoyed um, what I've, what we've done thus far. It's been very interesting to, to kind of read and see and watch kind of the elements come together. So because I do video stuff on my own, um, it's always lovely to see another perspective, particularly about things that are, um, for, so for me, I would normally call this sort of a video series because I come from the old video TV world, right? And mm -hmm. this is the type of content that really does, it's not entertainment value, it's really a trigger point for discussion and mm -hmm. ideas. It explores what's going on, but it also gives you an opportunity to um, you know, spin off it and really make change in society. And so that's one of the things I really like about what you're doing. I think the subject matter is really relevant. Um, besides for everything else about it. But the fact that you guys in the middle of all the stuff that's been going on just kept plowing forward with it, it's, it's amazing. And I can't, I can't wait to see it myself. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah so you're, I gotta you're find David $25. Attenborough so. For the break. I am the David Attenborough. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and as I was making notes, I uh, have to, you know, very, very grateful for um, the sponsors who have, enabled this project to, to make it happen. And they've been very supportive, not only funding wise, but words of encouragement and they're excited to see it, I know. And so our, our sponsors on this project are DART, Health City Cayman Islands, Enterprise Cayman, uh, Silver Palm Studios, who's our production, uh, our production studio, and our media partner, Cayman Life TV. So, so thank Patrick, you, thank well, you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm answering for everyone. Yeah, and um, if anybody and wants to sponsor anything we're doing or support or partner, uh, it's relatively painless. You know, you just give me a call, send me an email, happy to uh, work on bespoke packages and custom type things. Oh. And, uh, you know, um, supporting us in our mission to improve education in the Cayman Islands. Because we don't want to miss a beat. Not an ed beat. <laughs> So, that, Patrick, thank you so much. And I mean, folks, you can go to caymancurrent.org anytime. Uh, I say always and continue to say there is a lot of great material there. So uh, we may joke back and forth and make light of things here and there, but it's really it takes a lot of effort and time um, on the part of Patrick um, to really, it's not just um, here, let me write about the latest scandal that's going on. This, this is real journalism. This is what it takes. And it is not easy to do. And certainly it's not free, even though the, he doesn't charge for you to see Canaan current content. So it's, there's, the, the goal here is to have something that the community supports and that supports the community in return in terms of the kind of content that they're producing and creating, not just on the website, but also things like this video series, uh, this documentary. And also, you know, um, I love Patrick's been talking and really he had he was so far along and then COVID just got things complicated. But the idea of having panel discussions um, and engagement opportunities on an ongoing basis is really critical to continual improvement of education, supporting it and helping it grow. So my hat, if I had one off to you, Patrick, for doing it in the first place and an appeal to the community to come forward and support it. All you need to do is go to caymancurrents.org. There's information all over there or reach out to Patrick directly. That's right. Well said. That's what he said to me. You didn't see it, but that's exactly what he said. So anyway, guys, thanks so much for joining us. I um, can't wait to uh, get this online and out there for everyone to see. And Patrick, thank you so much as always. And we'll see you pretty darn soon here. Uh, don't forget the 12th, it, 12th, the 18th, right? That's the day of the festival. 
It's, home plus it cuts, it's a three. It's a three day event. We're on the 18th. So um, whatever days you go is great, but you got to make sure you're there to see episode one. Is that right? Episode one. Episode yeah. one. Fair enough. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Peace out.